Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today on Insight New Mexico in the Mercury Library with old friend, uh, human rights attorney, uh, ACLU attorney, uh, and I'm proud to say uh, Mercury author, uh, Maureen Sanders. Uh, please read her piece uh, on the fight for reproductive rights in New Mexico that appeared February 10th uh, in the pages of the Mercury. It's an honor and delight to have you here with us today, and I can't wait to get into some very important issues with you. Thank you, Vivi. I'm very excited to be here today because, you know, I've been a uh, reader of the Mercury since its inception, and thankfully it exists in the state of New Mexico because we need some uh, new sources that tell the truth, and I feel like that's what Mercury does. Boy, is that wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. Um, reproductive rights in New Mexico, as you observed in your piece, um, have been in a kind of a 20-year hiatus or kind of a stagnant time when, uh, when after, the, after the initial successes, we've been getting lots of little erosions and nitpickings and bad bills trying to undermine this basic constitutional right. Could you describe that, this sort of stasis and, uh, and what kind of new bills or uh, anti-reproductive rights uh, bills are being uh, floated now even? You're right that, you know, it's been, you know, a 20-year, um, you know, it's, I think it's a little inaccurate to say lull, lull. because I think there's been um, some activity in the legislature uh, every year, um, but because of the um, balance of power, if you will, in the legislature over the last 20 years, um, those that are for protecting the, re the constitutional rights of women in New Mexico had been successful in um, defeating any of the bills that had come up to erode the reproductive rights of New Mexicans. Um, now, as you know, we all know, the, there's a different balance of power, at least in the House, mm -hmm. and um, that's a source of concern because there are some bills up there this year that would provide for serious erosion of the reproductive rights of New Mexicans. Um, I happen to believe that the, the bills I've looked at may well be unconstitutional under the New Mexico Equal Rights Amendment, right. um, and, you know, but I would just as soon not have to litigate the issue and have the legislature stand up and, for the women of New Mexico and say, you know, we believe in reproductive rights. So there's a late-term abortion bill uh, that we were talking a little bit about and parental rights, uh, I'm sorry, parental notification uh, of bills. Could, could we talk about the parental notification issue and what that actually means to young women and, and their health in this matter? Yeah, the parental notification uh, bills are uh, a very serious erosion uh, for young women in New Mexico in need of medical um, attention, if you will. Um, most The statistics show that most young women who um, are pregnant do go to talk to one or more of their parents about the situation and make a decision as to what they're going to do as a result. Um, but there is a small percentage of young women who don't feel comfortable for whatever reason going to their parents. <clears throat> One of the reasons may be that there may be some abuse going on in the house or, um, you know, there may be some other dynamics in the house where it is a, you know, a threat um, to the young woman to actually have to go to her parent to talk about, you know, um, being pregnant and needing an abortion. And so the, uh, in those small percentages of instances where there's a young woman who um, needs medical service, then, you know, it's um, my belief that she ought to have a right to do that without um, her parents being notified. It's her health information. It's, you know, her... Um, her situation that is hers and it's not her parents and um yeah parents you know we encourage women to go you know young women um to talk to their parents but we all know that in these particularly in this day and age there are a lot of dysfunctional families and to force a woman a young woman to go and uh, have to talk to her parent before obtaining the medical services she needs um, is something that's very difficult. 
Um, some people think that the answer is what we call a judicial bypass and say, well, if you can't go to your parent, then, you know, go to a judge. Um, mm -hmm. And that's pretty difficult. Yeah, and yeah. it also um, elongates the process when somebody may well be in need of immediate medical attention, um, but may be hundreds of miles away from the nearest judge. And that's the reality in New Mexico. And it's already difficult um, to for women in New Mexico to obtain the full services of needed in the reproductive rights area because of the lack of providers within the state. And so, you know, it's already um, often a many hundreds of miles journey to obtain the medical services. And so to essentially put in two trips that uh, have to happen and, you know, go and talk to a judge and then talk to the doctor um, really makes it difficult. And these would be, of course, two terribly stressful trips. Absolutely. We, um, uh, the late term abortion bills that I've been reading across the country and around of are all, uh, uh, they all are concerned with something that almost never happens. And if it does happen, it almost is always uh, connected to to the health of the mother, and it's almost always a life and death situation. Is this one of these sort of? I mean, I'm kind of liking it, and I don't mean to be to be um, uh, rude or offhand about it, but it's almost like it's a kind of a formulaic uh, right to life, uh, um, uh, uh, right to work bill. I mean, this is this is a thing that has almost no meaning, but if it is passed and somebody really is in desperate straits, then they're going to die from it. It is a difficult situation, and I think the real thing to keep in mind is that this decision about what a woman needs to do because of the medical situation she finds herself in should be something that's done between her and her doctor. And in appropriate places, you know, her faith may come into play. But to interject the government into um, the the decision making just doesn't make any sense. Why is government deciding as to what serv what medical services will be available to a woman in New Mexico? Um, these are, you know, when you're talking about uh, late term abortions, um, they are very difficult situations and they are very sad situations and, you know, not something that people think about lightly. Um, you know, I will mention that um, you know, the Albuquerque was presented, the voters of Albuquerque were presented with, um, you know, a, a related type of bill or ordinance and, you know, in great numbers, I think it was like 55% to 45%, the people of Albuquerque said, no, keep government out of the doctor's offices. Let the doctor and the woman make those decisions. The same thing should apply across the state. And I think that... Um, I think that, you know, the 5545 um, numbers probably um, are the same across the state. Um, people don't talk about it a lot, but when it comes, when push came to shove in the Albuquerque vote, um, the voters of Albuquerque stood up and, and said, no, the women of New Mexico, the women of Albuquerque get to make their own medical decisions in consultation with their doctor. And I think that that should happen with respect to the current state bills that are up there in the legislature. Let's leave the decision to the woman and her doctor. You know, misogyny takes so many different forms. Um, that that 2013 vote was so important, and um, and it was odd because, of course, it was it was proposed as if it was a conservative idea, but it, but of course that's exactly the opposite of what many conservatives lead us to believe that they don't want to see a lot of government in their life. Mm -hmm. Could you, uh, in in regards to misogyny? Uh, uh, the probably the most wonderful and important thing that I that I think happened, and I believe it was 1973, New Mexico passed an equal rights amendment when the United States government, when the United States as a whole could not. It's almost exactly the same as the proposed ERA was in those days. Could you talk about its significance in these matters and in, in matters of reproductive rights? And could you also perhaps? Talk a little bit about why isn't it applied to other things like, say, for instance, uh, uh, differential wages and, and matters like that. 
<clears throat> I think the New Mexico Equal Rights Amendment is a wonderful addition to our New Mexico Constitution. And it came through a lot of hard work and a lot of um, uh, discussion in the legislature. And um, the people of New Mexico said, yeah, we're for that. We want to make sure that um, women, that people aren't discriminated against based on their sex or their gender. Um, <clears throat> the uh, importance of it is that um, under federal law and the federal New Mexico, the U.S. Constitution, the United States Supreme Court hasn't always um, held that uh, discrimination based on sex is worthy of real high level of scrutiny. Um, and um, so what the New Mexico Constitution does is essentially say, you know, gender discrimination is really something that we will not stand for in the state of New Mexico. And so um, in, you know, the decision um, uh, regarding uh, the fund, the state funding of medically necessary abortions under the Medicaid program, the New Mexico Supreme Court said, you know, gender discrimination is really important and not something, I shouldn't say important, it's not something that we will tolerate. And so when there is a distinction between the treatment of women and men, we as the court will look at that very carefully and put the burden on the government to show that they have a compelling state interest um, in trying to uh, justify um, the distinction between men and women. The tricky part is that that applies to government. And so that's why we need things like the Equal Pay Act and something things like that within our New Mexico statutes so that there are efforts um, or there are laws in the New Mexico statutes that apply to private businesses, that they have to pay equal pay, those sorts of things. And so, um, you know, currently right now there's actually a bill um, being uh, pushed by Representative Armstrong uh, from uh, the North Valley here in Albuquerque to give extra points to companies in the procurement process um, if they are, you know, if they can show that they um, actually are doing equal pay or fair pay. And so there's those kinds of things that need to happen. But I think your point about misogyny is that um, I think it's more hidden now. You know, it used to be that people were more upfront about their um, discriminatory biases against women. And now it's more hidden, but it still exists. If you look at the number of uh, women elected officials, if you look at the number of women CEOs um, in this state or across the country, you see that um, it does not does not reflect the population itself and so to me that's that's uh, an indication of uh, discriminatory biases but it's also an indication of how we train our women and we educate our women and you know I think um, we still do a bad job of bringing up um, our young women and our girls and training them to say you are you are a person of worth and, um, you know, for example, statistics show that a woman has to be asked three times before they would, by different people, before they will even consider running for office. That's the exact opposite for men. You know? <laughs> men are, you know, somebody says, hey, why don't you run for office? Man is there, you know, and a woman will not, you know. And so, you know, I've been involved in um, Emerge New Mexico which um, is a group that um, recruits, mentors, and trains uh, Democratic women to run for office. And it's because, um, you know, we need the diversity of women in our public offices from school board on up. And so, you know, we've now graduated uh, about 150 people over the last seven years, Excellent. and they're starting to run, you know. And so that's a good thing. It's a very good thing. <laughs> so you were the... Uh, uh, you were the the attorney who who won, if you will, the marriage equality mm -hmm. case uh, before the Supreme Court was it last year? Or the year? Uh, uh -huh. Could you uh, mm -hmm. could you explain what that was about, and could you sort of paint a picture of it for us? And that'd be great to know. 
Actually, I did. I was the attorney who had the honor of getting to argue um, before the New Mexico Supreme Court. Um, but I was a representative of a fabulous legal team that had been put together um, that involved two national organizations, including the National ACLU as well as the Center for uh, lesbian rights and those two national organizations um, you know spent many years getting that case ready I know that people think wow it happened and it just <laughs> happened overnight well that's kind of not true um, we uh, there were five or six local attorneys as well as the national attorneys and the local attorneys were all volunteer attorneys um, who did it did the work for free um, and because they believed in the issue. And so um, for several years, we were looking at it. We were working at getting plaintiffs. Um, what people didn't know is that the national organizations um, put some money into um, the effort to do a soft education program um, that was happening in New Mexico. Nobody knew that it was happening, but it was try it was an attempt to sort of try to change the minds and hearts of New Mexicans about the issue of um, same-sex marriage. And so there would be, you know, stories in the newspaper about a same-sex couple rescuing a dog. And there would be stories about, you know, adopting foster parents, foster kids and those kinds of things that didn't really have anything to do with the p subject of same-sex marriage, but was saying to the people of New Mexico, you know, same-sex couples are your neighbors, they're your teachers, they're your um, uh, colleagues, um, you know, and they, they have s lives similar to yours. And so as that education program happened, you started seeing the conversations changing a little bit. And, um, you know, sometimes the courts are the leaders of a movement and sometimes they're the followers. I think yeah. in this case in New Mexico, it was a little bit of both, you know. <laughs> and um, the New Mexico Supreme Court... Um, did a did a fabulous job. Um, you know, it came about rather quick, more quickly <coughs> than we had initially thought, because of an unfortunate situation, and that was that um, one couple that uh, we represented, um, one of the women was had a terminal illness, and so we had gone in to Judge Malat to say, please let this couple get married before um, one of them dies, and. Um, that was the catapult for, you know, saying, hey, everybody agrees there's no factual issues here. You know, let's get it up to the New Mexico Supreme Court. So it went fairly quickly once the case was filed um, and started moving. Um, but the process leading up to the filing was a long process. Um, and so once we were able to get it before the New Mexico Supreme Court, the court moved fairly quickly in trying to get it and got up there on a weird procedural thing which I won't bore you with the details because only weird lawyers would like it anyway <laughs> um, and I don't want you to lose your readership um, but and so you know we went up and the Supreme Court allowed for for the first time ever the argument to be web streamed and um, so word got out and so people around the state of New Mexico sat and watched the New Mexico Supreme Court argument and um, you know afterwards I you know got lots of emails for, from former students and stuff saying you know I've been a lawyer for eight years and I've never seen a New Mexico Supreme Court argument because not everybody goes to the New Mexico yeah. Supreme Court you know so um, I was honored to be able to be the one presenting it and I have to tell you that um, after the argument one of the um, national ACLU folks who was in for the argument and who had been working on the case came up to me and he said, you know, Maureen, I have been in every argument on same-sex marriage across the country um, for the last X years because he's been working at the ACLU for a while. And he said, I have never seen a court as prepared or as hot that's a term we use in the law, by the way. A hot panel where they're peppering you with uh, questions. And I've never seen anybody, a court, so prepared and so into really trying to um, get to all of the arguments and really give an opportunity for us to explain our position. And the court worked hard um, and issued a fabulous decision. Justice Chavez wrote it. And he started with... Um, 
talking about our clients. And I think that's the, I mean, I'm, I may be wrong, but out of all the cases I read across the country, um, I think this is the first one where the court actually talked about the stories of the clients. And um, <coughs> I think partly that's a result of, you know, the, the legal team's lawyering because we put those stories in every pleading that we file because we wanted the court to re recognize that this was about people and their rights and their happiness. <coughs> and in New Mexico, we have a constitutional right to happiness, but that's a whole other topic that we'll do another day. <laughs> so it was great to be before the court, and it was even more fun to win. I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know uh, who the who made the opposing arguments and who they represented. That's an interesting question for that case. Um, the um, because it went up on this procedural um, writ is what we call it. Um, the writ was done was filed by the county clerks, and you know you can imagine that the thirty three county clerks in the state of New Mexico have different views on same sex marriage, um, but they are the ones who issue the marriage licenses. There is no one state entity or um, office oh. that is involved, and so there were thirty three clerks and um, ultimately, they had a meeting, and they decided that despite the fact that some of them were for it, some of them were against them, against it, and some were not, didn't care, they needed one ruling. And so um, the so they were the mechanism, they were the individuals who actually filed the writ in the New Mexico Supreme Court okay. because once we won in the lower court, um, the we had actually sued the County of Santa Fe clerk and the County of Bernalillo clerk, um, as well as the state of New Mexico. And um, none of them disagreed with the ruling, and so there was not going to be an appeal from that ruling. And so the and you know there had been um, a variety of um, cases in different counties in the state, and so the clerks were the ones who let you know. I mean, they did their job. I mean, talk about stand-up folks. You yeah, know, it's really. like. We need to go as a group. And, you know, we had said, well, we may need, like, one or two of you to be the one that, you know, does it. And they said, no, we're all doing it. And so all 33 of them are named in the caption great. of the case. And so it went up on that particular um, uh, argument. And so the clerks didn't really take a position. They just said to the court, we need one ruling. And so the court had allowed Am Amiki to come in. Um, as friends of the court to give the public policy arguments and that kind of thing. And so the lawyers from the, um, I think it's called the Alliance for the Defense of Freedom, um, were at, were amici, and those were the, they were the ones, or, um, or he, he was the one who actually um, presented the argument um, for the other side in terms of the pol public policy um, provisions. And then the Attorney General's office also um, provided a um, argument to the court. Well, we could probably do about three or four shows on this topic, <laughs> Again, I hope we can in the future, honestly. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, we're running just a tiny bit close here, and I want to ask you about <coughs> a kind of wonderful moment uh, last year when um, you uh, uh, resigned your your um, part-time position at this point at the university over a particular action by President Frank. Um, that that I also wrote a little bit about and uh, and objected to when he gave uh, uh, the governor a um, I believe it's the presidential award of distinction for for basically uh, doing her job. Um, could you talk a little bit about your motivations and and what happened during that whole issue and what kind of response you got uh, from from the university and from around the state? Well, VB, I've been involved in education in this state since the 1970s when I first moved back here before I went to law school. And I was, you know, teaching at the, the high school level and, um, you know, had been a community college teacher in St. Louis. And um, then I decided to go to law school. And after practicing for a few years, I ended up back at the law school teaching full time. And I, you know, was a tenured professor at the law school. And I taught there full time for about 10 years. And so education is near and dear to my heart. And um, I'm generally concerned about the politicization, 
of um, education as well as the corporatization, I don't know how to say that word, uh, <laughs> of, um, you know, education. Um, and I understand that the university, you know, has to deal with legislators and, you know, has to be a player in the um, political system with respect to um, how it gets its funding and that sort of thing. But what concerned me when President Frank announced that he was giving a leadership award to the governor for her work in health um, was that it was announced about two weeks before the election. And, you know, health had been a big uh, topic in the um, governor's race, and I thought that it was an improper um, injection of the um, university into the election process, and I thought it was inappropriate. Um, and so I decided that I couldn't be part of an institution that thought that was okay. And so I used the only, um, you know, only thing I had, which was my longstanding relationship um, to the university, as, particularly the law school, to say that, you know, I'm severing my relationship with the university. And so I am, you know, I have, I will not be teaching any classes um, at the law school um, and <clears throat> as a result. And, you know, my, the reaction, um, it, it was interesting. I got a lot of reaction from for, former students saying, you know, pretty much, we applaud the position you're taking, but, you know, why are you punishing the future um, student, law students, by <clears throat> not teaching? And um, it really came down to, you know, if you're teaching at the university, then you're part of that system. And yes. if, it's, if it's an institution that you don't think is um, acting appropriately, then to stay, you're condoning the action of the president. And I couldn't condone the action. If you know, the president had made that announcement two weeks after the election, I would not have taken the same position. I would have uh, disagreed yeah. with his decision to give Governor Martinez um, a leadership war award in health because I don't think that um, this administration has been particularly good in the health arena. You know, we have children who are not being properly taken care of. We have children who are not being fed. We have um, benefits being slashed to those with developmental disabilities. You know, there's all kinds of issues with respect to health issues. So I would disagree with the decision to give her that award on the merits, but I would have not have taken the same position of um, <clears throat> severing my relationship with the university if the announcement had come after the election. Yeah, I had always thought that it was one of the major jobs of a president to keep a university out of the political arena as much as it could. Mm -hmm. We have run out of time, I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. and uh, I hope we can, hope you'll, you'll uh, grace the Mercury Library another time and, and uh, talk a lot more about women's rights in New Mexico and how they can be evolved and, and strengthened. It's just a, been a joy to be with you, and, and thank you so much. Thanks for having me, VB, and keep up the good work with the New Mexico Mercury.